Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Connect, President of Universal Accounting Center, and we're here for a great episode. I've got Craig Primo here with me. He happens to be the founder and president of K2 Securities. He's experienced in a variety of things that I believe as accounting professionals, we need to know and understand as we run our businesses and most importantly, work with our clients. He's involved with M&A, so mergers and acquisitions. So I think his perspective there is going to be very helpful. He deals with international businesses. And so I think that context is going to be very important. But lastly, one of the things that I think he's involved in that really values my attention happens to be the angel investing. It's that perspective of buying and selling the business that's really going to be a, a prevalent thing here today. So as we get started, first of all, Craig, how would you introduce yourself? I would introduce myself as a um, an M and A professional. Uh, I've been uh, working in the field for twenty five years. I spent ten years at the Citigroup Investment Bank. Okay, and uh, after that, I started my own broker dealer with my partners that we're as we left Citigroup after uh, the 2009 great recession yep and basically applying those same uh, principles and skills that I had developed at the, at the International Investment Bank to local and regional uh, market smaller clients really between about 25 million in business enterprise value all the way up to about 250 million dollars in enterprise value so uh, I some would say that that uh, uh, that I am like a, what, what a realtor is to a house. I am to a medium-sized business. That's the simplest definition in the um, the most common skill set or the most common case use case that I have for a client. Yeah, no, I love the simplicity of the description. It makes it relevant. So. Here's a few backstory things that I'd like to understand. Sure. One, it's the path to entrepreneurship. I'm clearly interested in what drove you to actually start your own business. But even before that, I'd be curious, what got you into the investment side, your career path, whether it's college or whatever, that got you to where you were involved with business as you were at the bank? Well, um, it's less planned uh, and more um, serendipitous than, uh, yeah, I often say I probably couldn't recreate what I've done today. I, there, there were... <laughs> There were doors that were opened and then doors that were closed. And, and I, I, I did okay taking advantage of the opportunities. Beautiful. But, um, I, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always thought about things in an entrepreneurial way. But then I, I started my career working for the least entrepreneurial situation where a large major money center bank, a world bank, which is incredibly structured and um, uh, – very corporate. Yeah. But I thought I had to learn and I learned processes. I learned how to live in an organization and and do okay in an organization for 10 plus years. But I was happy actually to move to graduate to entrepreneurship. I think it's difficult to just start out as an entrepreneur. Okay. I, I think it's best to kind of like cut your teeth in a corporate realm, um, uh, get some qualifications, get some logos behind you where you can then source business and um, uh, kind of move into it as an entrepreneur. I always think that the best entrepreneurs are the ones that do it when they're in their 40s. And that's what I did. Oh, very good. Okay. Yeah. So that moment when it was, okay, it's time for me to start my business. How did that come about? What what caused you to think, okay, I'm going to take that leap of faith, take the risk and do it? Well, uh, when you get riffed with 1,500 other people, reduction in force, 1,500 other people at the investment bank during the Great Recession, it kind of forces your hand. Yes, it does. Um, uh, which is fine because I, it was a cush job. I, I I was still learning a lot. I really enjoyed it, but I was kind of getting to that point where it was, the no, where it was no man's land, where I had to go all the way. Uh, or I, because in my early 40s, I was thinking I, I might not be employable pretty soon. Yeah. Um, so... I spent one day having a pity party for myself, and then I just picked myself up and I said, now's the time. I'm going to do this. Yeah. And my partners and I formed our own broker-dealer, and um, I, I had the skill sets at that point to source business, which is the most important thing in my in, in my in my business. People much smarter than me that aren't able to source business, um, uh, I've seen them fail. Yeah. Now, when it comes to being an entrepreneur, uh, a lot of my listeners, I think, can relate. It's not that they were longing for it, maybe wanted to have it happen when it did. Right. There's something that maybe happened in their life, a rift, as you were, you were mentioning, right. that forces us to say, okay, now's the time. And uh, at that point, I think a lot of us actually see ourselves doing something that we didn't plan on, didn't intend to do. Right. But there's another element, uh, family, uh, friends. How, how were they instrumental and supportive in 
your decision to actually start your business? My wife was incredibly supportive. Um, uh, she, I, I even coupled the the uh, uh, the um, stepping out of the corporate environment with moving from California to Utah. Wow! So I really made it really scary for everybody. We had young kids. We had a big mortgage. I had no plate. Didn't know anybody in Utah. But if I was going to restart, I made a conscious decision that this is the market that I wanted to do it in. Um, uh, I like to say I'm the tallest midget in this market, right? It's kind of a tier two market uh, uh, for, for tech. Some would say tier three, but it's one of the best of the tier two or tier three yeah. tech markets. Yep. And 11 years ago, there weren't a lot of service providers here. And it didn't take long for me to mature in the market and be and be fairly well known. It's really difficult to do that in a huge market like Southern California. It's easier in a regional market like like uh, Salt Lake City. Very good. Very good. All right. So one of the things I want to transition to in is the accounting perspective to all of this. Mm. As a broker, you're in a situation where you're working uh, with businesses that are clearly on that exit path. They're mm -hmm. considering how do I actually transition? Um, there's two sides to this. There's the acquisition side. There's the seller side. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering when the accountant is involved in this, clearly good books are essential. Good numbers are critical to the valuation. How do you play or, or maybe describe the value of that good accountant being at the table? I cannot tell you how important it is. All of the sob stories that I have in my career, of wasted time, wasted opportunity, failed processes, not all of them, but the vast majority circle around uh, um, bad accounting. Um, uh, and so I can employ those stories and explain that to prospective clients in a way and with credibility than account that an accountant can't do because I have really nothing to gain directly. Mm -hmm. I'm not selling my services to, uh, to, to, to self-perform in, in the accounting for that company. Yeah. I'm just telling them a story about how, uh, they absolutely need to, uh, uh hire a competent accountant to do these things years in advance sometimes to optimize the value of the business, increase the velocity in the process, decrease the risk, and and uh, secure the best deal they possibly can. And it's easier and more credible for me to sell somebody else's services than it is for my own because uh, obviously I don't have anything to gain directly. I do in indirectly, of course. Yeah. I'll close more deals. Yeah. So... Um, uh, just as accounting professionals have more credibility than I do selling my services. Craig's a great guy sounds better than I'm a great guy. Uh, so uh, that's what I've really learned that we can work hand in ha hand with accounting professionals to help each other and ultimately to help our clients, which is the goal anyway, right? Yeah, exactly right. Now, when you're looking at the financials of a business, how far back do you find that it's critical that the accountant have clean books for that business? The gold standard is, is three years. Yes. Um, two years is okay. Uh, but that, that's an interesting point. If, 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 if you're advising a client and you need at least a two year history, uh, and it might take a year to implement the changes you're going to suggest, you are three years away if you start the discussion right now, you're three years away from them being able to exit with the highest um, uh, benefit to them. Yeah. And so everyone thinks, well, I'm not ready to sell my business right now. Um, yeah, but you should be getting, getting ready. Uh, everybody is going to be separated from their business one day. Yeah. No matter what. Uh, so unless you're going to leave it to your kids and you know that's the path forward, um, then there is a reason to get ready uh, because if you're exhausted and you come to me, I might, I, I now have the, the, the uh, unenviable job of saying, well, there's going to be a discount to value because you haven't done X, Y, and Z and it's going to be Correct. a more difficult process. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to add to what you just shared. I think that runway is long. It's one of those things where a person preparing to sell their business isn't just a six month, one year decision. It's a three year, five year process. And there's a positioning going on. One of the easy ways to describe it is oftentimes, especially with smaller businesses, is they're looking at tax um, 
mitigation. They're trying to minimize their tax liabilities. Therefore, they intentionally try to show that the business isn't very profitable. And in that strategy, they pride themselves on the fact that we're paying so little in taxes. And that's something that they they uh, are happy with. But the problem is, is it's devaluing their business simply because they're strategically showing it's not making anything. Now, all of a sudden, you get into the mindset of, I want to sell the business. And the converse is true. I've got to start paying taxes. I have to show I'm profitable. Mm-hmm. I need to show I'm as profitable as I can be. But that's a hard pivot to make in a single year. And the financials can't be one year, I made nothing. And the next year, I'm, I was very profitable. I've got to show a number of years in in sequence of profitability to say, yeah, this business is a cash machine. This business is a very profitable thing that I can now pivot from. So what would you add to that? That is a hard conversation. Well, the conversation is easy. Uh, I find my prospects really resist taking that advice. Uh They've leaned on this business for so long. They are comfortable with the risk. Uh, you know, I'm basically telling them pay a bunch of taxes with the, the hope that's going to add incremental value to the value of your business. And it's, I, I would say, yes, I have those conversations, but, um, there are some things that they can do where I can explain it to a buyer and recast the financials to show what it would have been like if they did things to maximize profitability like the buyer will certainly do. Mm-hmm. And and that's and that's completely you want to hear some kind of examples? Oh, 100 okay, percent Got it. All right. So let's say they're they're they they own a fa- they own the facility, right? Uh-huh. And they uh there is a lease rate between the facility and the business. Uh let's say they're paying themselves a salary or not paying themselves a salary, right? Those things have to be adjusted out, right? If you are paying yourself I guess you really wouldn't do this. This would be silly. But if you're paying yourself uh, much more in a W-2 than you should, well, there's a recast opportunity there. Maybe you're uh, um, maybe you have family members that really aren't working in the business, but you're finding a way to 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 pay them um, uh, through the business. Those can be recast. I can explain Mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. There are other things that I've seen prospects do that are unexplainable, and they are not just red flags. They are stop signs. Okay. Right? Really playing with accounting, right? Playing with account. I'm sorry, playing with, with inventory numbers such that you reduce your gross profit and therefore you reduce your profit. And you're building up an inventory in the background that you expect to get value for in the sale. I mean, that is is a whole other level that, that we – we have to explain to our clients that will not look good in a sale process. You're basically going to have to explain to your buyer that you're cheating the government flat out. I mean, not just inflating expenses, running some personal expenses through the business. Those things are explainable. But doing something like um, uh, playing with a, with inventory numbers, that's a specific problem that that they have to stop if they want full value for the business. Yeah. Otherwise, they've already pre-sold their business in little incremental ways along the way, and they're going to have to take less for it. Yep. You mentioned red flags. Are there any other others that come to mind? Yes. Um, when I have when I engage a client that is a single owner, and there is no debt, I always just I'm always afraid to go through these financials because really. Absolutely. Um, when there are partners in a business, there is a professionalism that happens. It's difficult for one partner to uh, buy a very expensive vehicle and run it through the business, for mm-hmm. instance. Okay. Because the other partner then has to get that same benefit. So they just say, you know what, let's just keep things uh, uh, on, on the most professional level possible and let's just make distributions to ourselves. That's yeah. the way it should be, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, when there's no debt too, you don't have the pressure and the scrutiny of a third party looking through your financials. And so you, you, you tend to do things a little bit, uh, um, more aggressively. And so the scariest situation, single owner, no bank debt, because that's a bit of the cowboy where I see most of the, the, uh, um, uh, the chances people take. Um, on their on their financials and 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 so anyway that that's it's not always the case but that that is that's the environment where it happens most often so that intrigues me so if a business was not highly leveraged and was out of debt 
I would assume to the buyer that's more appealing because it gives them the opportunity to become leveraged. It doesn't matter from the buyer's perspective because the buyer is buying these businesses generally on a debt-free, cash-free basis. Uh Sure matters to the seller because their shareholder value is much reduced if they have debt. But if if that debt is powering their business, I mean, it can make it can make sense. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I, but but buyers normally, especially private equity buyers, will employ debt to this is how they can pay the multiples they, that they have. They're, they have to use the debt to do it. It's impossible if not. Interesting. OK, so let's talk about now valuations of the business. Mm-hmm. There are numerous ways to value a business, and clearly it's in the eye of the buyer more than anything. Right. But in accounting, EBITDA keeps coming up. That's right. one of the more traditional ways to at least assess the valuation of a business. Mm-hmm. Can you speak to whether or not that's something that is of value and how the accountant can leverage that as they relate to their clients, what's happening in the company? Yes, we need to be able to calculate the profit of the business. Um, we usually take out interest, depreciation, and amortization because those things speak more to capital structure than they do to to, to sustainable profits, right? Uh-huh. So this is why everyone talks about EBITDA, EBITDA, EBITDA. Yeah. Uh, through the last cycle, people didn't want to talk about EBITDA. They wanted to talk about multiples of revenue, like profit wasn't important. Uh, but I think we've seen the pendulum switch back where, oh yeah, revenue growth is great, but you have to show a path to getting to profitability. In the final sense, all of these businesses have to turn a profit. Even Amazon, even though they lost money for a decade or so, yeah. they had a plan to make money eventually. Um, nobody's interested in putting money into a business that where there is no plan to eventually get all your capital back plus interest. So I think that that any investment bank worth banker worth the salt has to be able to explain the true sustainable profit and profitability of the business in the historic period and going forward in a way that the buyer can understand, can can, um, uh, uh, assess for themselves and then calculate for themselves what the value value of that business is to them. And a banker often creates a process where you have three or four competent and um, uh, motivated buyers working that process putting their offers together at the same time, that's making a market. That's the only way to value a business, the best way to value a business, right? That's more valuable than what my client thinks their business is worth or what I think their business is worth. With a market check like that is the only true way to value a business. Appraisers do it all the time, but they're just, those are substitutes for mimicking what they think is going to happen in that process. Yeah. So the accountant, the individual listening to the, the, uh, podcast, they're in a position where they're regularly working with the client. And although the business owner may not be in a position where they're preparing to exit, Mm -hmm. the accountant, I think, as as I would describe it, has a number of responsibilities, one of which is to see the business as an asset and to see value in it and helping the business owner understand what that valuation is. When you're working with accounting professionals and they're not necessarily in the sell process. Mm -hmm. What should they be working on with the client, bringing to their attention from the accounting information that would be valuable to at least from a business point of view, run the business more profitably, equitably, and so forth? Well, I think they need to to start with a conversation of what is your exit plan with this business? Uh, I think that'll get their client or prospect thinking about what to do um, they might say, well, I've got no plans to sell in the next couple of years. Okay, yeah, but do you eventually want to sell in five years? That's not so far away. Uh, we're building your chart of accounts right now. Uh, you know, in a sale process, we have to be able to explain. A buyer very well might ask you, um, what is the gross profit margin by line of business over time? Maybe uh-huh. down to SKU over time. If, if, if you're not prepared to answer those questions, uh, then you might need to go back and rebuild your chart of accounts, recollect information, start a new historic period. It just it's so much better to do it right up front. Yeah, bake it into the process. You're adding real value too to your uh, your clients and your prospects when you're having these conversations. Nobody is talking to them about this. They don't know what's coming. You need to know what's coming yeah. so you can proactively be a a, a trusted advisor. 
uh, which is going to dramatically increase the stickiness of your relate, deepen your relationship, uh, enable you to charge more, uh, enable you to um, keep your clients longer and um, monetize the relationship for the benefit of everybody. Uh, I'm loving this part of the conversation because I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things that I think the accounting profession is missing and is needing to pivot towards is becoming definitely more that strategic advisor, more engaged with the business. And your comment that we should start conversations with our clients as to what is the exit strategy? What's the end game? I think it's just a, a testament to the fact that we begin with the end in mind. We're mm -hmm. going to reverse engineer this entire process. If you're wanting a $25 million business, $10 million business, $5 million business, we can we know what that's needing to look like at a, at a very specific level and we need to build towards it. And it starts, as you're pointing out, with the chart of accounts and looking at the correlations between gross profit to total income. We've got to be looking at expenses to gross profit. I mean, there's a lot of elements there that we need to be looking at rather than just providing financial reports and trusting the business owner knows what they're looking at and can assess what's happening. We need to get more involved with the client and be as I refer to it, asking the question, therefore, what? We've got all this information. Mm -hmm. Now what? And that then pivots from this historical perspective to more this forward thinking, business plan, forecasting, all these different scenarios. That's where I think it's really creative and fun for the accounting professional, both from a tax advisory standpoint and a business advisory, CFO and advisor level. Um, let me, let me uh, ask regarding uh, these three roles, and I'm curious what you're going to say. Typically in accounting, we refer to this, the, the roles of bookkeeping mm -hmm. or bookkeeper, mm -hmm. accountant, and CFO advisor. Mm -hmm. um, your interactions, I'm sure, are with all three as you're dealing with different size businesses. What is it you feel they may be missing in their roles that you could perhaps speak to? Is there anything that the CFO should be doing that you too often run into that they're not or the accountant bookkeeper? Well, I, I think it, I think it's important for uh, the not so much the bookkeeper because that's more debits and credits. They they are focused on a job and they have a big and a very important job. But if you're talking about a CFO, uh, advisor, mm -hmm. uh, or an accountant, th these these people should be having proactive conversations. Uh, I we've seen it all too often where. The accountant knows how to run the business looking at these financials, but he's not running the business. Yeah. And the owner knows how to run his business, his or her business, but they're really not they're they're really not running it from they're not they're not taking full advantage of the financials and the reports and the reporting. I think it's crucially important for the CFO and the accountant to to help train the owner to bridge that gap, right? Um, uh, the skill sets of the owner are extremely important. The skill sets of the accountant are extremely important. And there's too much of a divide between those two. Uh, they can learn so much f and it doesn't take much to train them if they're coachable and open to it. Uh -huh. And you're just deepening the relationship and locking really in, closing that gap. Uh, and, and I think you're going to make your, your, um, uh, the owners, um, better owners to run the business and uh, in a position really where they can speak to the accounting better, which is so important. Absolutely the language of business. Um, really some of the, the, the most impressive entrepreneurs that I've seen have an accounting background. Right? Interesting. They've got their feet in both worlds. Yeah. And that is, that is like a rock star. Um, uh, the accounting is so important. Uh, but we ne each need to get out of our our comfort zone a little bit, and we're each going to be better. The entrepreneur slash business owner and the accountant. It, it makes the job more enjoyable for both, too. Yeah. Right? Well, everything you just shared there really resonates with me, and it's something that my, that my listeners, I'm sure, have heard me kind of focus on. Because what you're addressing there, I think, is too often oversimplified, at least I think I too easily explain it, but it's so essential to the success of the business. One, accounting is the language of business. The business owner is very effective at what they do. They're running the business, they're in the day-to-day -day grind, but the accountant 
needs to be that interpreter, the translator that takes the accounting information, what the business is attempting to communicate to the owner, but the owner doesn't speak accounting. Right. The accountant needs to then become that interpreter, that translator that takes that financial information and gives it to the business owner in a way that they can use and understand mm -hmm. and therefore empower them to make more informed business decisions. Now they're no longer running it from, say, a wisdom or a gut impression. They're running it with more information and right. there's a wisdom about that. And all of a sudden the business business owner is able to make better decisions because they have accurate information. And then all of a sudden the creative space comes in. It's that, okay, here's what we know has happened in the past, the last six months, 12 months, we've got some trends. How can we actually use that to our benefit to run the business more effectively moving forward? Right. These are powerful things and it's easy for me to explain it. But at the end of the day, it's it's a process to implement this, to correlate that accounting professional with the business owner, build that relationship of trust, have them kind of work together. There's a, there's a power that can come from that if it's done right. And clearly, as you were mentioning earlier, the accounting professional can be paid very well for that role. I, I think it would it, it reduces burnout for the accounting professional too. Uh -huh. I mean, they are really so important. Um, and I know that they they probably spend, I've never been an accountant, but they probably just are filling their day with things that are urgent and important. There's deadlines, there's always tax deadlines, there's always deadlines, always deadlines, always deadlines. So it's it's really easy to just get caught in this box, in this mm -hmm. circle of doing the urgent and important. Well, they're doing the things that are urgent, I should say. But th this this coaching between them, the closing the, the gap between them and the business owner is super important. Not for today, yeah. but it is for the longer haul, a year, two years for the sale of the business, certainly. And I, I think it, it, it enriches the experience for both parties, too. So I, 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 I'm a huge fan. Um, of of kind of of the the marriage really between the accounting department and and the owner of the business because that that is a powerful combination. Beautiful. Let's talk about tax for a moment. I don't know mm -hmm. what you may have here. There's a distinction in my mind between a tax preparer, the one that's actually doing the forms, filing on time, and being mm -hmm. accurate. But there's that role of the advisor, the the more planning type role of the tax professional where they're coming in and taking the strategy to the business owner of here's what we can be doing to minimize, mitigate some tax liabilities. It's a proactive approach to the tax throughout the year. Do you get very involved and is that interesting in, as it relates to the sell of a business or looking at the company as to its tax strategy? Yes. I, I see this so often too in my own personal life because I own businesses and um, uh, it is, we all, and accountants are the, are the most guilty of this, I really think, spend a lot of time in the rearview mirror and don't look through the windshield. We're not talking, we're not looking at the future. And that future could just be this year, right? I mean, after January 1st, you've you've lost a lot, an opportunity to save taxes on the prior year. That discussion should be happening in October, uh, in November. Um, uh, and I... I there's so much you can do if you've had, obviously, if you've had a big year, you can sit down and say, you know what, let's push some of this revenue off to next year to the extent that it's possible to do so legally. Um, uh, and like I say, some things I can easily recast in the financials to show, to really, to, to honor the matching principle of the revenue and the expenses. Mm -hmm. I can just recast it. Hey, if you want to prepay um, uh, your um, insurance of $100,000 in late December, you, you can do that. Um, uh, I, I will be able to match that back to the right year for the purposes of the sale of the business. But that's a conversation you should be having with your accountant. Yeah. So you that you can actually take advantage of that. And the savings, the tax savings, more than covers the cost of the, the relationship between the two. So you're yeah. paying for yourself in spades as an accountant, if you are able to provide that sort of value and coach and teach your your clients. So um, I, I would say it's the proactive discussion uh, that you can have with them and really, really understand their business. If these accountants can really understand the business of their clients, then they can prompt qu questions and, 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 and be curious about different strategies and work through that in October and November. 
Perfect. You know, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about what you were sharing is the fact that there are these different strategies. And as a business owner, they want to find out what strategies are. I was very frustrated in running the business just to simply work with a preparer, someone that was just going through the motions of filling in the forms and filing them in a timely manner. Clearly, I'm grateful that it's done accurately and right. timely. But what I'm looking for is, can someone help me more strategically run the business? Not as I'm running it from a profit point of view, but from a tax point of view. And so mm -hmm. that tax advice, that strategy, it's very insightful because they see the business a little differently than I may. And that perspective matters. So I, I'm like you're describing it. They pay for themselves in spades and, and that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to M&A, I'm just curious, what is something that someone misunderstands about what your business is, what your role is? I, I think that, that sometimes people give us too much credit for being able to sell and explain a um, explain away a a problem in the business, uh, people that are buying fifty million dollar businesses are at least as smart as me, probably much smarter, and um, I always have to deal with them on a credible basis. There's not much I can do other than explain what has happened in the past and sell the future, right? Uh, so I, sometimes people give us too much credit for being able to, oh, this is all about messaging. You need to message this differently. No, no, the, these buyers are smart. We have to treat them with respect and credibility. Um, and that goes back to um, visibility and um, uh, providing a data book or providing a portfolio that they can use to assess the business and then build their valuation of the business because we don't normally val we don't normally go to market with a price we let the market yeah. establish the price we cluster the offers together and then the highest and best offer is compared to what the seller or our client thinks the value of that business is and if a exceeds b there's usually a transaction very good um I'm going to ask a question here that I'm, I'm hoping you've got some some insight on. So I'm curious what you're going to share when it comes to business. One of the things that happens is uh, from an accounting perspective is they see their business as their client list. They're thinking a lot of the value just exists in the clients that they have. But as I've worked with a number of firms that have sold and transactions that have happened of accounting firms, bookkeeping businesses and so forth, is that there's three components to it. It is the list. What, what do you have with regards to the client list that you have, how long you've had the list, the value that they're paying on a, on a monthly or qu uh, quarterly basis? Those types of things are relevant. But there are two other components that really determine the valuation of that firm. The next is the processes, the standard operating procedures that they have internally to ensure that there's continuity of the workflow, mm -hmm. that there's a, a process that's e easily replicatable so that as the business is acquired, it's ensured that it's going to be followed. There's something there to, to uh, uh, actually service the clientele. But the second is the employees, key employees, management, basically individuals that are going to ensure that the processes are adhered to and done. And those three things typically rise to the top as to ultimately how the business is valued. Would you add any more or clarify any as to an accountant who's trying to figure out, okay, what is my business worth and what do I need to be working on as I'm trying to build my company? I like what you're saying. And this, I am not an expert in selling accounting firms. Never sold one. Somebody has one, a big one, please find a way to call me and, and, and we'll talk. But uh, yes, the first step is, is kind of the systemization. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it's not scalable. It's it's not repeatable. Um, uh, it cannot be relied upon uh, in the future unless you have that sort of process in yeah. place. If you don't have that, if, if what you have is the value is in the person itself, himself or herself, and yeah. that's personal goodwill. Yeah, I can't sell people. Correct. I mean, that's that's especially when they're leaving. Especially when they're leaving. Right. I you know. There's a saying in my business, there, I think there's about 15 million businesses in the United States. Um, and that there might be an old number now, don't quote me, but it's a big number. And the vast majority of those, I mean, maybe 95% never can break about $10 million in revenue. And that is because you have business owners running the business. And there is a difference between a business owner running the business and a business owner running an organization mm -hmm. that runs the business. That's right. 
that is that is like the difference between a lightning bug and a lightning bolt. Huge difference, right? So what the, the difference really is that you are setting systems and processes processes in place so that you can go on vacation for two weeks and the business doesn't fall apart. Yeah. You are, in my case, decraging the business. My name is Craig. The business is all about me. If it's all about me, that's a problem. I can never sell this. Mm -hmm. um, but if I have an organization of people who are paid a fair wage and um, it can exist without me for short periods of time, that is an important process to do. So I imagine that's very important uh, in in uh, in how they they you know in creating a business that can be sold. The first example of me running a business normally not a business that is sold, and that's okay. There's plenty of business. My business, for instance, might not be able to be sold because so much of it is is about me sourcing the business and my two man team processing the business. You take one or two of us out, there's nothing to sell. Yeah, got a couple of used computers. That's it. Yep. Um, but other businesses are meant to be sold. And some of these accounting businesses should be an asset that, that can be monetized someday. But you do that by running the organization, not doing everything, not self-performing everything yourself, because that you're not for sale. That's right. I, I, I'm very grateful that you explained that because so often when I'm having conversations with accounting professionals, they need to see their business exactly as you described it. It cannot be them. Now, clearly I work with individuals that are solopreneurs. It, it, they don't have intentions of growing the business. But at the end of the day, I think they recognize they have a job. They right. have a business, they own it, but it's their job. If they don't do it, it doesn't get done. Right. So there is very little valuation in that. They can may, maybe sell their clientele but that list is a single transaction and it's lacking in what they could have done if they just built an organization, ran an organization, removed themselves from the day-to-day -day roles, the day-to-day -day tasks. And if they can standardize their processes, get some key employees, they have a business and an organization that would have some value. So I appreciate those little insights. Um, this is going to be another topic that I'm sure you can speak to. The idea is today we have a generational change occurring where many businesses are being sold. People will throw, throw around trillions of dollars as numbers to say businesses are in the next five to 10 years mm -hmm. moving from one generation to another. Many people are looking to retire and exit. And as these boomers, these, these people are retiring, they're going to try and get as much as they can out of the business. But more importantly, there's a transaction happening there. And as accounting professionals, we have a part that we can play in these small to medium sized businesses as they prepare to exit. And most importantly, try to get the biggest valuation that they can out of that transaction. Mm -hmm. When an accountant is marketing their services, trying to go out there and be a unique business, what recommendation would you have towards either niching their services as it relates to these transactions occurring, acquiring clients that are, our, that are the buyers of these businesses and meeting their needs, helping the businesses that are selling, helping them go to market. What do you see from an accounting perspective as it relates to the opportunity that maybe the next five, 10 years affords us? Well, I, I think that uh, there are, as the economy gets more mature, there are more and more transactions that happen. And this silver tsunami, whatever they call it, where, yeah. where all the baby boomers are are retiring, we're kind of at the tail end of that now, right? I mean, uh -huh. we used to talk about 17,000 are retiring every day. Uh, so um, 1,700, anyway, a large number. I don't remember where they used to kick around. It must be 17,000. But uh, I, I think that that if, if they can present themselves as a partner with this business owner in maximizing the joy in their life with, the, with respect to the business of, uh, you know, we're, we're going to take care of these services so you can be um, uh, unshackled, do what you, what you do best and what you enjoy most in the business. And we, if there is a terminal value for this business, we're going to help you increase that and monetize it when the time is right. But you don't start getting the business ready when the, when the guy is exhausted and you have to back up and do all of this change out to make it ready uh, to get to the point where he can run a process. Because w often what we found is that when an investment banker comes in and they say, all right, we need to get ready for the sale of the business, he is often interfacing with people who already are working 50 hours a week and um, 
are skeptical about the process because maybe that accountant might get laid off at the end of the process as the buyer brings in their own accounting team. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I just think that that you should be thinking about these things ahead of time before you hire your account or when you hire your accountant. Um, uh, and and if you just simply add this these these tasks to um, that the accountant's role early on, then after a couple of years, it's 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 all it's all done, and it doesn't have to. You don't have to go back and redo it again. And you also put the accountant in a position of, of saying, you know what, I am an important component in this, and eventually when they sell the business, I'm going to be the most important person in this process. And I tell my my owners, reserve at least one year's salary for each accounting professional because we're going to work them very hard and they need to have a payday here. If they're not an owner of the company and they're not getting a payday, it's going to be very difficult for me to keep their attention. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's do it early. And even if we don't do it early, if we do do it early, but you got to pay, you got to pay out a bonus. And if you don't, you might have to pay out a double bonus. So you brought up one of the things that I think is very relevant to the accountant they're wondering okay with all this stuff going on it's clearly not my business i'm right. the accountant and i'm watching this stuff all happen um am i running the risk of losing a client and running out of business simply because of the transaction what can i do as an accounting professional the tax preparer and so forth to ensure that in the transaction i'm retained by the buyer that i don't i'm, I'm a valuable element as to the business model that I don't want to be that expendable part. I, they're going to want me to stay on. I, I'm not sure that's the right focus. Okay. Uh, because you may not be able to control that at the end of the day. Um, I, I have, uh, there are private equity groups. I know that as a matter of course, they're like, it doesn't really matter. We're replacing the accounting, uh, you know, the, the, the auditors with our auditors, no yeah. matter what. Yeah. Right. So there's nothing you can do. Um, I, I would look at it slightly different. Okay. Um, I have conversations with accountants all the time, and I try to convince them to introduce me to their best clients. Yeah. And no one's ever said this to me, but I'm thinking they're looking at me saying, "Why would I introduce you to my best clients? You're going to sell them, and that's going to maybe it'll be more work for me in the short term. I can make more money, but then I lose my client, right?" Yeah. You're you're saying exactly what I was just asking. It, it, it's 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 really the wrong way to look at it. This this is absolutely the wrong way to look at it. Um, the, the, for for people who have introduced for a quality accountants who have introduced and related professionals who have introduced me to their best clients, um, strengthen that relationship in the short term. Increase the amount of business that they process for that client in the short term. And yes, I will, I'm sure, be successful and I will sell that business and they might lose that client. I wouldn't worry about that. I will give them three for every one that happens like that. There's trust that has to happen with that. I might bring them business first. They might bring me business first. And by the way, that guy's going to sell the business anyway. Yeah. Right? That's right. You can't keep that guy to 90 years old and, and, and he dies with his boots on. It's not what you want to do anyway, and it's not going to happen. You'll just be out of the process, and he'll sell one day, and you, won't, you might not even know what's going on. So you can take a proactive role, one where you are um, trusting and you are using other professionals like me to increase your business and add value for your client. If you focus on the client indirectly, you will you will pay, that'll pay dividends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so two things that you said that I'd really, really like to emphasize for my listeners. One, as the broker, one of the things that you're bringing to the table as they may lose a client with the transaction is the fact that you're oftentimes working with business owners that are wanting to sell whose numbers are messed up and they need accountants. And you're going to be able to introduce these accounting professionals to these clients that they don't already have and really start servicing them as they're preparing to exit. But I also like to add the fact that that business owner who just left and got a good exit and made some good money, they're typically an entrepreneur at you know, at heart through and through, what are they going to typically do next? They're right. going to start a business. They're going to start a business. And what role did you play in that recent transaction as their accountant? 
you played such a vital role. Who are they going to reach out to and say, hey, I've got another opportunity that I'm beginning. And who do they want to, to be part of that? So in theory, yes, the transaction happens and you may be uh, pulled out of that equation, but you may be given an opportunity with the next one and you get to build that business from scratch. And I think that's more forward thinking and more positive for the accounting professional to realize rather than having a scarcity mindset of yeah, all of a sudden I'm going to lose a client. Let's look at it from the standpoint of I'm working with a broker. They're going to introduce me to three other businesses that are messed up in their accounting and I can be part of getting them ready to go to sell. But at the same time, each of these entrepreneurs, I'm going to be involved in, in the next uh, rodeo. The ratio might be even higher than three to one because with, with if you look at my funnel, uh -huh. I have probably at least 150 deal conversations with prospects a year, right? And too small, too small, accounting messed up, but whatever. So, but I know the ones that I, I say, these are interesting businesses and this will be a prospect for me in two to five years, Yeah. right? Um, the, the best thing for me to do with that is introduce them to a, an accounting professional. Right. And, and then I put that in my pipeline report and I check in every six months, not with a client or the prospect. I check in with the accounting professional and I say, hey, is, is this 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 client that, that you engaged that I gave you uh, six months ago, two years? That, that person now is is working. They are a, uh, a trusted advisor of this prospect that is too small for me right now. But in three to five years, they're going to be ready. And this is, I you know, I become like a farmer where I am planting seeds. Yes. And it's not enough to plant the seeds and then go away. You have to, you have to till the ground. You have to water it. Um, not every seed will flower. Um, but that is a three-dimensional long-term strategy where you're putting the client first. Um, and it is difficult to do because, it, because our initial reaction is scarcity, which one am I closest to money to right now? But that's no way to live. Yeah, it's no way to live. That so the accountant that can take on a, that, that can develop a little bit of the entrepreneurial mind mind really is in a, the best position to flourish in their business. Yeah, there's two things that I would add to this. One, your role with that accountant when they're a trusted strategic advisor for the business owner right. is so valuable because when that business owner starts to show signs of wanting to exit you're trying to reach out to the business owner may not be as productive as if the accountant recommends they work with you. A hundred percent. That's that third party credibility. Yep. That's why I say, who's the best, um, um, uh, you know, um, person to, to market the services of an accounting firm? Well, how about somebody that's not going to make any money on that transaction that is smart and un that everyone understands um, is in a position to know if this is a valuable service for that business owner. In that same way, the accountant bringing me in and making a personal recommendation, there's a little bit of risk in that, mm -hmm. sure. And I'm taking a risk over here too. Yes, that's why you have to develop relationships with people. And um, I, you know I, that risk is worth it. Sure, you lose every once in a while, but <laughs> on balance, you, you know th that risk pays dividends. If you're making um, uh, introductions that have no benefit to you. As a matter of fact, may even put you in a position where you could lose the client. Yeah. You have the most credibility, but you need to trust that, 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 that in this situation, that I'll be able to fill up that bucket more than you just depleted it. Yep. Yeah. It's that fiduciary fiduciary role that we have with clients where we're putting their best interests at heart. Um, the other thing that I would add to this is how valuable as a trusted, trusted strategic advisor, as an accountant, we can play the role of CFO and advisor, which is to say, we're not brokers. We're, right. we're not in that space of selling the business, but we can do numerous things over the course of years to help increase the valuation of the business, help the business model that our clients have. And as an advisor, help them address the various risks yeah. that they have in the business that's devaluing the company. And if we actually come in as business advisors, we get paid for not just the bookkeeping we're providing, not just the accounting we're doing, not just the tax preparation and planning we're doing, but also this advisory role. There are numerous ways for us to be bringing revenue into our firms. And it's each of these independent services that compound the bookkeeping services, that's a commodity. 
Right. That's something that's not paid very well. But at the advisory level, I can be paid handsomely for the services I'm providing as I help the business look forward and make decisions that eliminate risk, increase their EBITDA and so forth. Now I'm a champion and all of a sudden they get introduced to you at the right time. That package looks great because there's very few things that are you know, undone, untouched. Mm -hmm. They're all put in place and they're all ready to go to market. That's true. Also, as you're in these meetings, you are learning things about more things about the M and A process, yeah. where you can help all of your clients, and you are, um, and the entrepreneur is learning things about accounting that can help him in this endeavor and the next one and the next one after that. Uh, it, it is really how you build a career and a money making machine that adds value in your community too, because I. So much of this is, is sure, it's about money too, but it's also about production. It's also about producing something. Humans are meant to produce, yeah. right? Working dogs, you, if you had like a Australian shepherd and you never took it for a walk, it would tear the house apart, right? <laughs> they want to work. They want to be out there. Yeah. Horses are the same way. I think people to a large extent are that same way too. Yeah. And so I think this adds to the joy uh, and the... Um, uh, the it'll help it'll be less burnout for the accounting professional to be more of a three-dimensional advisor and learn more about each other business my business and that entrepreneur's business on a deep level i'm loving this so are there any associations um places that you feel are great for accountants and m a and brokers to collaborate i know there's epi exit planning institute with scott snyder there's value mm -hmm. builder with uh, john warlow there's some great things i'm familiar with and that i engage in so that i can have these kinds of relationships mm -hmm. are there ones that you participate in that you find are valuable for the accountant to maybe know about no uh, maybe i maybe i should learn some. <laughs> i mean i'm gonna learn something today about this right so i don't i don't I, I, I have a hard time too because sometimes I get so focused on developing and processing business and maintaining my relationships that I don't think about different ways to connect with people or to um, uh, to learn. So I, I really don't. I don't have any advice on that. Okay, good. Oh, well, um, the ones I mentioned, I would definitely recommend. Okay. Uh, very involved with Value Builder, John Waterloo wrote a book called Built to Sell, Automatic Customer. Mm. Great resources and information there. Definitely empowering to the accounting professional to help them more towards that advisory role so that they can assist the clients and basically help them build a business of value. But then there's also the Exit Planning Institute. Scott Snyder heads that. And essentially what it is is it's this place where you can go and meet the brokers, the M&A people, the lawyers, the accounting professionals, and as a team of individuals service the clientele. So mm -hmm. there's a variety of things out there that, that I think in the marketplace we can tap into and really make the most of this, if, if not you know, niche our way into offering quality services to our clients. So a lot of good things there. Um, let me kind of go to a personal side of things. Uh, clearly, you've made a good run of this. You've been doing this for a number of years. How do you feel this has impacted your family as your children, your wife look at what you've been able to accomplish. What do you hope they've learned from this? Well, let me back, back, take a little step back. I often find that the children of business owners often don't want to get into mom or dad's business uh -huh. because they have seen mom or dad work very hard and come home very late and maybe complain about the business. Uh, and, and so oftentimes you don't see a succession plan anymore. It's very rare where the business owner, the entrepreneur, the lightning in the bottle has developed that, ha has a chip off the old block that he can hand that off. Fascinating. To, okay. Right? So um, in my case, my kids weren't interested, are not interested in my business and never worked in my business. Um, but I, it has impacted them this way. I think they have an appreciation for entrepreneurship uh, that is pretty significant. It's allowed me to be a father more, be there at the little league and, you know, uh, be available in times that, that have not been traditionally, if I had, it was back at Citigroup, I really wouldn't be able to break away as easily. So they've yeah. really appreciated the flexibility of my schedule. Now there's a cost to that. Uh -huh. And the cost is when that phone rings, if I'm in the end of a deal process, even if we're on vacation, I usually have to take the call. 
And I hate that. I wish it wasn't that, wish it wasn't the case. But again, I'm trying to put the client first. This is a $50 million deal. This is heady stuff. This is important. I'm on speed dial and I need to be able to be there for the client. So to answer your question, I, I think they've seen the good of it. You know, my clients or my kids, one of them particularly, who's a kind of a computer science kid said, I can never do what you do, dad. It's too risky. Mm -hmm. And I don't see it that way. I don't see it. I mean, um, sure, an entrepreneur wakes up every day unemployed and they have to go out and they have to kill what they bring home to the family to eat. That's right. Yes. But think about it. The What's the alternative? The employee is in that same situation, except they don't have a visibility as to what's going to happen next like I do. Right. Um, we're all just. As employees, we're all just, uh, um, you know, one quarter away from being laid off. We just don't know it until we are laid off, right? Uh, so I think that that uh, my kids see the entrepreneurship. They didn't really pick up on the entrepreneurship. They're not on. Well, my younger son looks like he actually might become an entrepreneur. Very good. But my older one, um, at least for now, kind of, you know, would rather get the paycheck. But I haven't given up on him. He, there's an entrepreneur in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right. So regarding your family, you mm -hmm. brought up vacations, taking the phone call. Um, there is risk. There is definitely some some hustle about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, what do you do to recharge? You know, I, I travel a lot. Um, uh, I, I I can turn the phone off. I've got a great team now, very confident, highly paid team that uh, is um, incentivized, uh, uh so my interests are completely aligned with them. And I think I'm able to to trust in them to handle problems because I've trained them over the years to do it. Um, so I'm able to turn the phone off more than I used to. I'm kind of I'm 58 years old and I, I eventually want to retire. And that doesn't mean retire like my grandparents and maybe your grandparents did. Yeah, different. They, very different, right? Retirement today, I think, is doing is having the assets and the health left to do exactly what you want to do every day. Mm -hmm. So I work a little bit less. I hand a little bit of the things off that I don't want to do until I'm just doing the things that I really want to do the most. And eventually I can fully retire, uh, hopefully, and 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 uh, get out of the business. But uh, I, I think I elongate my career if I'm able to hand off, delegate to people. Yeah and do things more that are my highest and best use. Uh, I can't look at a spreadsheet and process a spreadsheet the way I used to, um, but I still love the people and the interaction with the people. So if I do that more and more every day and develop my guys so that they understand, they can learn how to do what I do and eventually get away from the spreadsheets, uh, I, I think it, it's part of the human life cycle. I can do it all and, and I can keep my career going longer. I like how you describe that because in a previous podcast, I had a guest on, uh, Dr. Sabrina was talking about something she refers to as the $10,000 task. And so often the entrepreneur is still doing the $10 task, the $100 task, the $1,000 task. And it's clearly like you were describing, what are those essential things that only you can do? Delegate the rest and get yeah. to that point where you're doing the core stuff, the things you perhaps enjoy the most. But now it's eliminating so many of the other things that are perhaps time consuming and you can focus on what matters most, giving you the ability to not be exhausted and worn down. You're able to now recharge, go on to those personal things. She's actually an advocate of mm. a four week vacation. So uh, definitely taking a month off is a challenge for a lot of people. So it's a thing that she has a lot of people aspiring to do. So it's quite impressive. My guys, do, I mean, I, we have an unlimited PTO policy. Um, I take more than four weeks a year on vacation and um, I encourage my guys to take as much as they need. Now they got to take it based on the cadence of our, of our deals. Yeah. Right. And so that's hard to plan for. Uh, and they, they have to, or if they're, they're going to go away, they have to be available and bring your laptop. That's the cost. Yeah. Right. Um, but they're tethered. They're, they're, they're a bit tethered, but they're incentivized and there's, there's a yin and a yang there. You know, I'm old enough that I actually remember when I got, it was a Nextel phone. 
kind of a walkie talkie type mm -hmm. of phone that you would beep and it would just chime into the other person. And it was fascinating to me because it was different than a cell phone. It wasn't you dialed and it rang and I could choose whether or not to send it to voicemail. It was a walkie talkie of the sorts that it just pressed the button and they were they were talking now. Right. And uh, that being uh, very much tethered to the business, I carried that around. And initially it was pretty impressive. I'm in management. I've got this this phone. It was high tech. Uh, I could carry it around and, you know, it turned heads and it was in interesting because it, it wasn't a a phone call where the ear was hearing it. it was more speaker phone kind of thing. So everybody was hearing. Yeah, that was fun for a moment. And right. then it became this tether that I was uh, quite burdened by. But anyways, uh, the business went from an eight hour shift, 10 hour shift to 24 seven. I was available. My management was calling me, you know, Saturdays, Sundays, nights, evenings. So it was just pretty interesting. But sometimes that's that trade off if you're yeah. going to have this unlimited PTO policy. So I got to do better at that. I could learn from that statement. I, I got to do better at, at uh, turning my phone off, going on a silent retreat or something. I, gotta, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we can all do that. All right. Uh, the next thing is regarding your uh, vacation. You said you travel a lot. favorite place. Where do you like to go? I love Latin America. Okay. I, I think it's, it's incredible. Um, I spent uh, a couple of months in, in Mexico City, Worked doing my job uh, 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 Q4 of last year, mm -hmm. and um, I, I love new places. And I've just found that the uh, the food and the people are terrific. And it's also easier to work in Latin America than it would be in Europe because the time change isn't as dramatic. Yeah. And um, yeah. I've often thought that that retirement might be fun out of the country, and so I'm always looking for you know how I can transition, where I can transition. I mean, you know, through the pandemic, we saw all these people, these digital nomads, and I mm -hmm. wanted to do that a little bit and yeah. see what that was like. So uh, expats, are you in that community? Um, no, when I when I go to these places, I, I don't want to be around any gringos. I want to be around um, uh, the, yeah, the, the native folks. So yeah. expats, I normally think of kind of in a, in a walled area off, off on their own. I guess it can be the other way too, but... But uh, no, I, I want to I want to immerse and, and really understand the culture and meet people that I wouldn't ordinarily meet. Try to learn a new language, new food, nice. that sort of thing. Yeah, no, I know of a number of individuals that will go get like an Airbnb, live there for a number of months, say three mm -hmm. months or so, and it is in the in the uh, community because you know it's not like the next door neighbor is also from from out of the right. country, right? So they're there, they're taking in the culture, they're experiencing the local traditions, they're participating in maybe a holiday or two that's going on there. So yeah, it's a different lifestyle. But when you go south, as you indicated, you're not dealing with the time zone issue as much, right. and so they're able to go south, Costa Rica, uh, any place actually. Costa Rica came to mind because I've got a, a few people there. But anyways, uh, they're able to actually have a lifestyle that's different than the United States, maybe a different cost of living, but same bil abilities because of remote work to service their clientele and do what's needed and be productive. So it's I, it's a fascinating lifestyle. I remember during during the the pandemic, um, you know, many tech employees moved out of the state of their employer mm -hmm. and were doing their job remotely because everyone was sent home to work, mm -hmm. right? Well, they That's said, right. well, you know, I'm, I'm going to move out of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move to Salt Lake City. Uh, they didn't tell their employer mm -hmm. because- What does it matter? Who, who, who do you, well, it does matter, right? Because maybe this is an employee now working in a different state and that employer is not com, com, uh, you know, comporting with the employment laws in that state. But it was weird because these employers had no idea where their employees lived. So I, a couple of my clients said, you know what? Every year we have the the uh, if they're if if they're remote, we have our employees attest. We want to know where they live. We need a test to where you live right now because uh -huh. we need to comply with the, the local state uh, uh, labor laws. Uh, so I just thought that was it. Nobody ever thought of that before. Well, I was amiss, and you called me right. Um, it does matter. Mm -hmm. um, the ability to do the work, perhaps not, but right. the compliance issues do matter. And for my own company, I'm experiencing this. Uh, my employees now, more than 50% are out of the state of Utah, which is where our corporate headquarters hmm. are. And that transition has caused a number of changes and issues that from a company point of view, we're having to address. Uh, just providing healthcare to our employees has become an issue now. So right. these different things that used to not be 
important or things to deal with, I'm now having to address. But it even goes further when you start to go internationally. Those same labor laws exist internationally. If you're working from a place where you're residing for a period of time, now you're actually living in a country. You're not just visiting. You're not right. just you're not just vacationing. You're now living there by their definition. And then all of a sudden there are labor laws and taxes and so forth that start to come into play. And the company is unaware that this is going on. They didn't know that so and so had, you know, gone off elsewhere. Maybe management knew the, you know, the team lead or whomever. But it's not like they're reporting to HR. By the way, this employee moves states. They're in this different place. They're working here. That never made it over to that compliance side of things. And now they've got these tax issues that never even came up before. And now they're just rampant. So the, yes. the line is blurred. If you go on vacation to to Cabo San Lucas for a week and you bring your laptop, are you are you know are you working in Mexico now? Probably not. But if you have an Airbnb there for three months, are you working in Mexico? Maybe. Yep. If you move there and you buy a house and you are living there permanently, yes. Right. So uh -huh. I don't even know where the line is. And that's different for every jurisdiction or language uh, challenges. And and so uh, it's it it is it everything has changed so dramatically. And um, but I, I think the opportunity is great. You know, that you can take a call anywhere now. I, you can't even tell if somebody's out of the country no. and call. I talked to my partner the other day. He's in Egypt. And I'm yeah. like, it sounds like you're down the street. It's yes. incredible. Yes. No, I'm, I'm really enjoying this part of the conversation. This is quite fascinating. I think a lot of people really, especially in the accounting space, are drawn to the fact that they can work theoretically anywhere. And now we've got remote clients. You can have clients anywhere around the United States or out of the country. And uh, there's a need for that. And clearly they're you know meeting that need, but it's bringing in all these little elements that maybe we didn't all consider. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is good. All right. So uh, best vacation. You, you brought up Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what did you like about it? Food is second to none, right? Uh -huh. The food, I, I, I mean, Mexican food, Italian food, those are kind of the top of the heap, right? Um, but I also love how Mexico is... If you go to Mexico City, for instance, it's the same altitude as Park City. Oh, okay. And um, the 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 weather is like Southern California. It is perfect, uh, perfect almost year round. Um, uh, you know, seventy two degrees. They have a rainy season, sure, but the weather is fabulous. Most people they say, "Oh, I've been to Mexico, Cabo San Lucas, and Cancun." Well, if you go to the coasts, it's very hot and humid in the in the uh, in the summertime. Yeah, so that's not the case in Mexico City because it's on a plateau. Uh, and it's closer to the equator. And so it's very temperate and very cosmopolitan. So I really, really like, I'd say my best vacation is I took um, a month and my wife and my two kids, when they were in high school, we went to Europe and it was an incredible vacation going to Europe for a month. So I'm a huge fan of time. I mean, what do we, we only have time here, right? We yep. you can't squander that. Yeah. Well, coincidentally, I'm going in a few weeks on a cruise and then going to Europe for a conference and I'll be staying there a little bit. So I've got this uh, lengthy excursion of sorts while I'll be working remotely and uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be an interesting experience. The time difference will be an issue, but nonetheless, I'm going to be working my way further and further east and we'll see where where we end up. We're talking about Switzerland and so forth. And so. you're bringing your kids too? Or no, just my wife Just and your I. wife? Yeah. Well, you can use that to your advantage. What you can do is you turn on, you know, you say, look, after dinner, I'm going to come back and I need to power through, through some emails for an hour, two hours, whatever. Yeah. Take some calls, et cetera. But you can actually turn your phone off because the all your clients and employees – prospects are sleeping yes. while you're enjoying yourself in Europe. So you can you can do that too. That's what I did when I was there for a month. It worked out great. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Um, mentors, uh, being in business, running a business. Do you have mentors or have you worked with a business coach? And what did you learn from that experience? Never worked with a business coach. Of course, I've had mentors. They're so important. Um, there's about five guys that, that, you know, a guy who worked with me at, I worked for a U.S. congressman. For a number of years, I, I at Citibank, I I had one or two mentors, um, other business slash personal mentors in my life. It was never a formal mentor mentee relationship. We yeah. never said anything like that. I don't even know if they they know how much they meant to me, but I picked up on their mannerisms. I picked up on their goofy sayings, and um, I have tried to be a mentor. To, to the people that, that work with me uh -huh. in, in those same ways. And it's interesting because eventually I start to hear them say things that 
I that came from me, right? I that is that that uh-huh. is the way I would say it's it. a Craigism. It's a Craigism, right? And it's 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 kind of, it's kind of flattering, but it's nice that that they're picking and choosing things that they like or that resonated with them about me and they're employing that in their life. Maybe there are things they didn't like that they definitely don't do. And I don't, I don't know about that. I'm sure that's the case too, but uh, it's nice to see how I benefited from mentors in my life informally. They meant so much to me. Uh, And in that same way, I'm trying to do it informally to the people that want to, uh, you know, below me. And I, I think it's, it's, it's great. I love that about business. Yeah. It, well, honestly, it's like raising another family. It's, they're, they're picking up on your idiosyncrasies and they're going to run with what you do. And hopefully they're picking up on the good things. Right. So. Yeah. I'm sure there's bad things they shouldn't do, but it, it, they figure that out too. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, regarding business, do you have a mantra, a process, a style, a philosophy that you run your company by something that you've adopted from a book you've read or something that you've just learned? Let me answer the question that I want to answer in that. And I think it, it will 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 get to what you're what you're asking for. The, what I really love about business is the trust. Okay. Um, you cannot uh, you cannot get rid of of any risk. You, you cannot say I'm having a relationship in business that involves no risk to me. Um, there are societies where there is no trust and they are dirt poor. The trust is what makes all the business happen. It's lubrication that makes all the business happen. Um, we talked earlier about me having a relationship with an accountant that trusts that I am bringing them business in good faith mm-hmm. and trusts, and, and then I trust them that they are, are in good faith introducing me to their best clients too. Um, they can get burned. I can get burned. Mm-hmm. And I have been, and and they have been, and that's okay too. On balance, it 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 pays off huge. I love when I take a little bit of a social risk with somebody that I have built up trust with, and they honor that trust because I can trust them with more next time. I I mean, how many times have deals gotten done um, on handshakes? On you have my word. Uh, Look, the cost of litigation is outrageously expensive, yeah. right? Like $200,000 in some cases, right? What that tells me is every contract worth less than $200,000 is worthless. You can't rely on the enforcement, on, on the judicial system to, to square it because you're going to spend it all with attorneys anyway, Yep. right? So so I, I run my life and I have my business philosophy where I... I trust and um, I also uh, make myself trustworthy too uh, because really when you have a contract with a client, this is just a way to assess whether they're trustworthy, right? You have a very important long contract with a client. He, uh, let me sign that. I'll sign that right here. Well, okay, he hasn't even read it. I need to know that you understand your rights and responsibilities mm-hmm. and I'll outline my rights and responsibilities. I'm looking you right in the eye and I'm going to assess whether you're actually going to come through. I love that trust um, because people have trusted me. They've written checks they didn't have to because, well, th- that I couldn't force them to mm-hmm. simply because we had an agreement, not a written one, but a verbal one or maybe a ethical one. So the trust in business it works in the United States. It makes all of this possible. It doesn't work elsewhere. A lot of places don't. It probably doesn't work in the Soviet Union. There's corruption rampant in South America. I know that their poverty, a lot of it is as a result of that lack of trust. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you bringing up this issue of trust because someone's word is their bond mm-hmm. matters a lot to me as well. Um, I'm, I'm shocked by how many people agree to something and then later try to wiggle their way out of it. And yet it was clear what was expected. It was very, very well explained what was going on. And yet so often everyone wants to get out of jail free card at some point. And I appreciate you bringing up this idea of trust because it, it runs rampant, uh, in uh, a number of societies where it doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I well, and, really appreciate it. And, and there are examples of that where you can get burned and people try to weasel out of it like that. But think of all the times where somebody has had an opportunity to hurt you and they didn't. Yes. 
right? And that happens more often. And that kind of fills me up that, that somebody trusted me enough um, uh, to give me information that was helpful to me, that I needed to hear, that was ethical to receive, and that I didn't violate that trust and vice versa. I mean, that really is impressive to me and important to me. And it happens a lot more than people getting burned. Well, think uh, about with Airbnb, right? Yes. Who would have thought that you could trust somebody to go into your house and not walk out with your 36 inch television, right? I mean, if, if I would have told you, hey, we're gonna let somebody stay in your house and they're not going to really steal any, I mean, it turns out you can kind of trust people to get in somebody else's car in an Uber and um, uh, it, 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 the trust makes all of the business possible and we see it every day in ways that we don't even really recognize. Well, I'm gonna take it a step further and I realize there are exceptions to this and I realize that there are evil players in the world, but our society, like you're describing, is built upon trust. When mm -hmm. I go to buy something, I trust that the metrics are exactly what they are, that if I buy a pound of something, I'm getting a pound of something. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trusting that when someone makes me a meal, that it's someone making me a meal and it's been produced where I'm not going to get sick. Right. You know, they, they followed certain pro Tons protocols to make sure I'm not going to leave there unhealthy. There are so many examples of how our society, our monetary system, the fiat currency that we're on is based on trust. We each believe that this value is equitable for both of us to transact in. Right. And so there's a lot to be said with what's going on as it relates to our economy, our culture, our relationships. There's a good underlying bit of trust. Unfortunately, it can quickly be brought away, but right now it is what sustains the economy and the relationships we have. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. So thank you. All right. So here's where I could do something that's kind of interesting and fun. I'm going to put the, the uh, conversation in your hands. I'm going to offer four topics and you get to pick which we're going to discuss. Okay. Okay. So as it relates to business and so forth, is it faith, music, uh, with regards to work life balance, the whole idea, do you have one in there that you think resonates that you feel is relevant to our conversation today? What are my ch choices again? Faith, faith, music, music, work life balance. And I'll throw in another one. Love. I would say love. Okay. What is it that is passionate for you that you love that you feel drives you in your, in your business, in your relationships? I, I am so impressed with how the business enables people to live their lives. Um, I, I remember when I sent my youngest, my wife and I sent our youngest son off to college. Um, I, I took a picture of him leaving, going through the old, it was last day of the old airport before they oh, tore wow, that yeah. down, right? Yeah. It was like three or four years ago. Yep. And um, we're sending him off to college in a different country and he's pulling his, his suitcase through security and I, and I took a picture of my wife that was, you know, crying. You couldn't see that she was crying. And I posted that on LinkedIn. And I, it wasn't an opportunity for me to uh, uh, to brag about what college he was going to, or or um, uh, to give him props for getting into go, going to college, or to talk about him in any way. I didn't even mention who. You couldn't see who he was. I didn't mention who his name. I didn't mention where he was going to school. I just was overwhelmed with love and gratitude for the people in my life in business that trusted me enough to work with me and let me help them. Yeah. Because none of that would be, none of any of this would be possible with, without that sort of love and support and trust. Yeah. And um, I was just so grateful that, 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 that people cared enough and that, that trusted me enough and liked me enough to do that, that made this possible for my family, who I love. Yeah. And hopefully in some ways that I did that for them too. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That would, that, that's, that's sometimes these, 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 uh, you know, love and trust and, and kind of conflate together. But. So you mentioned two things, one now and one we discussed earlier. I'm going to bring them both here and I'd like your, your thoughts on it. Okay. I talked about abundance, scarcity, abundance, but then you just, you just, uh, just brought up gratitude. Gratitude, mm -hmm. I think is so so important. Mm -hmm. um, when you hear those two words, abundance and gratitude, what do they mean to you? What are you grateful for? I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for the skills God gave me to, to have an enjoyable life, um, to help other people, 
to be productive. Um, I, I'm grateful to live in the present, which is very difficult mm. for me to do. Yeah. It's extremely difficult, but it's the most important um, uh, way to actually live. I spend a lot of my time, or I have, and I still will in the future, and I try to do, try to do less of this. Um, uh, regretting things in the past yeah. and worrying about things in the future. Uh, and having general anxiety about all these things. So those, the acronym is worry, anxiety, regret, war. And I try, I try to not do any of that. I try to live in the present as much as possible because the only gift that I can give you, I, the only gift that I can give anybody I'm talking to is to really, really be here. And it's difficult as we've talked about, oh, you've got to be available 24-7 um, I'd be able to take your client's call at a moment's notice. And there have been times I have, I have cheated myself and the, my loved ones out of being with me because I have a hard time toggling between business and personal. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's a modern day challenge with the phone. I love it and I hate it. And I'm sure you do too. Yeah. Right. Well, the thing that you just touched on is something that I speak to quite regularly. It's the idea of being present. It's where I get my mental sanity. And uh, this war acronym that you just brought up, I think is very valuable. Um, that worry, being anxious, regret. So many people, I think, live in those and battle those fights all the, all time. the time. Worry is, 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 is living in the future. Yeah. Right? Paying a bill that isn't, might not even come due. And regret is living in the past, right? So like you're just not living in the present. I would hate to add up how much time I actually have spent up to this point in my life living in the present. It might be a very small amount. And yeah. I, I don't like that. I got one third of my life left and I, I want to maximize the time in the present. Yep. Stop and smell the roses. Right. That's right. Okay. Uh, that, that is hugely important. Okay. So I'm going to now do some rapid fire questions yeah. and uh, they're just quick. You just pick and you let me know. Right. Uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Money or fame? Money for sure. Read a book or watch a movie? Read a book. Disneyland or Disney World? Never been to Disney World. So I'd say Disney World because okay. it's new. Okay. Drive or fly? Drive. Love road trips. I love it. I'm going on one here real, real soon. Uh, uh, breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. Very good. I like it. Okay. This has been an amazing conversation, Craig. I, I really appreciate this. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of wrap some things up here. And okay. as I wrap them up, I'm going to come back to you for a closing thought right. and just kind of have you put the uh, cherry on top of all this. But for my listeners, here's what I'd like to do. First and foremost, Craig has offered, if you'd be interested in connecting with him, communicating with him, talking to him, he's offered to actually do so. You can go to his LinkedIn description, connect with him there. He has his contact information. And then reach out. He'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions, particularly as it relates to business and most importantly, your clientele. So if there's something that he can assist with as, as you're trying to actually be that trusted strategic advisor, reach out to Craig and make those connections. And whether it be personally or professionally, he's offered to express some, or offer some time to actually address those things that you're dealing with. And hopefully from this, maybe see where we can maybe help one another. And that'd be very helpful. The other thing I'd like to do as quickly as a summary, uh, or actually before I go to the summary, mention one other thing. There were a number of topics that we brought up today that I think you would actually appreciate as a listener going to the books, Your Strategic Accountant, and also the book, Your Profit and Growth Expert. Each of these books actually address a number of the things that we were talking about today as it relates to working with your clients, beginning with the end in mind, servicing them to actually build a business that's an asset that has value and what it is you can do as an advisor to assist in that capacity that in addition to the compliant work that you're doing as an accounting professional, what is it you can do to step into that role as an advisor and actually help your clients ba basically run their business, work on their business with your assistance. And the thing that's most importantly uh, important here is the fact that you're able to get paid what you're worth providing these additional services. So go check out the books your strategic accountant, and your profit and growth expert and get that information there. Now, as it relates to the summary, this has been an amazing conversation. I was excited to talk about basically the world of being sold, the broker M&A type world. And I really appreciated the insights that came from our conversation. One of the things that was very important to me is just how do you actually mitigate risk, build value? We talked about EBITDA, but more importantly, just the 
essence of having good financials, having the two, three years worth of numbers that the business owner can lean on with confidence, that a buyer can look at and understand what the business is. I think that's very valuable. And I believe as accounting professionals, we can better service our clients by actually going in and keeping them uh, or keeping for them these valuable sets of books. The other thing is the strategy, whether we're looking at mitigating tax liability or building profit so that we can build the valuation of the business. That was an, uh, a very good part of the discussion. But one of the things that I took from that part was the idea of having lines of credit or drawing on debt and having something there to be entirely out of debt as a company may not be as valuable as I once thought. I clearly thought if if I'm out of debt, I must be worth more because I don't come with baggage. Well, you implied something different there. So I'm definitely interested in learning a little bit more about that. The other thing that I also took from the conversation today was with regards to the trust that we need to have in one another as it relates to our businesses. There's a trust that the broker's having with the accountant. There's a trust that the client is having with us. I mean, there's a lot of trust going on back and forth. And really, it's a business of trust. Ultimately, at the end of the day, as accounting professionals, I truly believe that we know more about a person, about their business, than anyone else that they know. Their spouse may not know everything about the company that they share with us. The employers, the managers, uh, they, they don't know as much about the business as that owner confides in us. There's just a lot of trust going on. And I think we need to be respectful of that. And uh, as we become that trusted advisor, that strategic advisor, we just need to realize that there is a value there and it may not be monetary, but it is trust. Uh, the other thing that I really appreciated was your sharing how valuable family is. Family for me is also something very important. Uh, at the end of the day, that's why I do what I do. I'm trying to take care of them, provide for them, and I'm trying to do so in a way that I'm uh, ethical, that I'm mm -hmm. someone that they can esteem and look up to and be proud of, that I'm their father, their husband, and so forth. So at the end of the day, value, uh, family coming in was very important to me. And then this last thing, a huge important thing, because I very much believe in abundance and gratitude, but you tied to it this essence of being present. I speak to that all the time, and I wasn't familiar with this acronym of WAR. That resonates with me, uh, avoiding the worries, the anxieties, and the regrets. That's something that I find too many people dwell on and at the end of the day make unhappy. And uh, I like to think that I'm more present and more aware and able to enjoy life as it presents itself to me, the here and now. And that's something mm -hmm. that I'm very grateful for. So wonderful conversation today. What do you have as a closing thought? I've really enjoyed this. You you, you, you really ma made this a... a uh, um, a, a terrific interview for me. Um, I, I'm impressed, and my, my closing thought is this: to, to your, um, uh, uh, to somebody watching this, that if if you have a a uh, a question, or if if this is if you're curious about this at all, I would encourage you to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy, even if there's no personal benefit to me. That's not important. Um, I try very hard to make. When I was when I was younger, I was very idealistic, very interested in politics. No interest in that anymore. I'm trying to make the circle around me as big as I possibly can, and then someday I'll croak, and that'll be it, right? So, uh, if 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 anybody wants any help from me, I'm happy to provide that help. Um, I won't self perform. I'll actually help you learn how to fish and then you can fish for yourself. That's the most important value I can add. So reach out. I'm happy to talk. Craig, this was awesome. I really appreciated sure. this. As I wrap this up, just a few quick things for the listeners. One, if you haven't liked or subscribed to this podcast, definitely do so right now. Do so and get the notifications each and every week when we release new episodes for you to actually learn things that you need to as it relates to building the premier accounting firm in your area. We have on the show experts each and every week to actually share insights as it relates to marketing, selling, pricing, client onboarding, tech stacks, just a variety of principles that you need to be aware of to be the premier accounting firm in your area. So like and subscribe to the podcast today. Also join us for GrowCon. GrowCon is an annual conference that you do not want to miss. It's a conference for owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. It's where we come together and from the stage, hear from the experts, get the advice that we need to to work on our business. At the same time, we're also able to meet the peers, the individuals that like us are running their businesses, collaborate, learn from, and most importantly, see what it is we can do to actually uh, grow our business and service our clients better. And then lastly, you get to meet the team here at Universal Accounting Center. Those individuals 
individuals that are committed to your success, allowing you to be in business for yourself, but not by yourself with Universal Accounting. The other thing I'd like to point out is we have a variety of free resources that you can check out at universalaccounting.com. Go to the free resource section and see there the courses, eBooks, white papers, just a variety of things that are in enabling you to find the time to work on what matters most to build your business. Take advantage of those opportunities use those resources and enjoy them. The other is the podcast. We actually have in the navigation on that website, basically the highlights or playlists of various episodes that we've put together. Wherever your business is, whatever needs you have, we put together a collection of various uh, podcasts that you can listen to and binge. And in doing so, focus on what things are that matter most to you right now as you're working on your business. Lastly, always remember this. If you'd like to apply these principles in your business and would like to learn more what you can do, reach out to us. You can contact us at universalaccountingschool.com or give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it is about accounting, it is universal. Take care, have a great day and be safe out there.